We're talking about Deadpool's box office success and big profits at Burger King on this consumer goods edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. Sean O'Reilly here from Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is Tuesday, February 16th, 2016, and joining me to talk about all things consumer goods is the one, the only, Mr. Vincent Shatton. What's up, dude? Hey, Sean. How's it going, man? Good. I'm, I'm doing really well after you and I went to see Deadpool yesterday. Yes, we did. Um, we went up to Chinatown in the nation's capital and went to the, was it Regal? Regal Cinema. And uh, your fiance and her friends were love, uh, nice enough to join us. And uh, wow, it was a really good movie. You liked it, yeah. I, liked I was. It, too. it was fun. I, I mean, it's rated R. It's super crude. I my mom was asking about it because everybody's raving about it on like the morning news over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's raving about it. And my mom's like, "What's this Deadpool?" And I'm like, "Under no circumstances are you to go see this movie." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be pushing it. I I don't know if, if how my mom. Would uh it, would receive the yeah. film, um. But uh, this is the Motley Fool, so of course we're talking about investing and in stock sure. market and everything. So, what were the financial ramifications of the success of this movie? Yeah. So, uh, the film has done incredibly well. Uh, the buzz around it, the general uh, critical reception, has allowed it to break quite a few records. I mean, the marketing um, alone was genius. They had yeah. those funny billboards. They made it like a rom com. I mean, all of it was just yes. Anyway, so yeah. um. Domestically, they're estimating that it generated about $150 million in ticket sales, foreign, uh, foreign box office receipts, about 130 So right. These are to- huge numbers. So total for- take from the long and double holiday weekend, which I'm sure benefited them, was a, a little over $280 million. And this is on a $58 million budget, <laughs> approximately. That's so- uh, which doesn't include all of the marketing costs, which were probably extensive for this film. Right. But, just, you know, but even if that doubled it. Just Let's just pretend they spent hundred. Overall, yeah. this is still an extremely relative, mo- relatively modest, modest budget. Not only for a major studio production, but for one of these superhero productions in right. particular, which generally have you know, usually cost over hundred million dollars. Right. Well, and so what popped in my mind when you showed me this earlier was. Um, if memory serves, I think like the Dark Knight, which the buzz around that was huge mm-hmm. back in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, or whatever. Um, I think that made. I mean, if it made over one hundred eighty million, it wasn't much more on opening weekend. It was probably like two twenty or something, and that's for a PG thirteen movie. This was a very, very, very rated R film, sure, and sure. it made this much money. So the movie did incredibly well. Uh, they actually are now claim the number one spot for. For several categories, um, best rated R opening weekend of all time, best February opening weekend of all time. Um, that those same records apply for all IMAX theaters as well, um, and it's actually the biggest opening for the studio that produced it, 20th, 20th Century Fox. Really, which we will get to and how that imp- um, wow and what that means for the uh, their their parent company, but. Another interesting fact is that the director, uh, his name, name is Tim Miller, uh, this was actually his first major film production. Uh, his previous credits include some short films, some visual effects work on p- popular video games, but again, this is the biggest new director opening weekend as well. Having seen the film, I have to think that the visual effects that the director had some experience with came in handy. <laughs> exactly. And some of the international markets did very well for Fox including uh, Australia, Taiwan, Brazil, Hong Kong, again, all their biggest openings for that studio. And in the end, uh, you know, the high ratings, positive buzz from the audiences should drive a lot of momentum for the movie. Like, it's not coming up against, like, huge releases in the next week. Right. So it's very likely, you know, building off on that momentum to probably claim the number one spot again for next weekend. And... Uh, an interesting note, actually, was for this past weekend, was the first one that Star Wars The Force Awakens has dropped out of the top five. The the Force was strong with Deadpool. So, since that movie came out in mid-December, this is the first weekend now, you know, or in mid-February, that it's dropped out of the top five for the weekend. So, it looks like the run for that movie is officially right. starting to wind down, really. That's actually kind of ironic, because if uh, memory serves, 20th Century Fox used to own and produce the Star Wars films. Yes, the prequels, exactly. Yeah, and anyway, okay. So uh, what does this mean for 20th Century? Because uh, their stock's up, isn't it? Like, this is is good stuff. So, um, 
the studios banking on you know some of these super superhero films to continue driving the the results for their film and entertainment segment at 21st Century Fox, and uh, you know that's the second largest business for them. It makes up about one third of their top line, and just to to give you some perspective, um, for the film and entertainment segment. Five of their top ten opening opening weekends have been from Marvel titles. Deadpool is now number one. The other four are the X Men movies. Right. Okay. And then uh, the two of the others that you mentioned are actually the Star Wars titles too. The yeah. prequels. So they they definitely are kind of depend on those proven franchises. Uh, and but the thing is, they also have a lot of great movies on tap. The studio has. Um, you know more Marvel coming with X Men Apocalypse, very very highly. Yeah, which we saw a preview for that exactly. In Deadpool, so. and they also have the standalone Gambit uh, origin story probably coming out soon later this year, and they also have you know long long awaited sequel with Independence Day Resurgence. That movie, do you realize how much uh, money the original Independence Day made? Yeah, it was it was actually coincidentally one of Fox's highest grossing films of all time, and they also have Assassin's Creed. Coming out, and that's based well, that's the on video game. Yeah, 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 yeah. A huge video game franchise that has sold over eighty million total copy total copies in its run because they have had like I think nine installments oh of the gosh. game at this point. Um, so that's very also that's also you know has a lot of fans excited and hopefully can be a um, a big blockbuster for them. Um, but with all that said, you know they have this really strong slate come. Um, they have this really strong slate of movies lined up. But the thing is, as is always the case with you know, a Hollywood-based business like this, it can be really hard sometimes to call right. how successful these movies were. You know, they had a huge flop last year with Fantastic Four, same studio. Um, so it can be really choppy, can swing high or low uh, with unexpected hits like this one with Deadpool and, you know, disappointments like Fantastic Four. You'd think the right. whole superhero thing is, is pretty proven at this point, but they still have their flops as well. Um, but at the same time, I think management... This, they seem to show or prove that they kind of understood their audience with this movie. They marketed it brilliantly. Flawlessly. And the buzz in terms of social media and all these other places just really added to, I think, the success for the movie over the weekend. So hopefully that's something they keep in mind and can leverage going forward. Um, and in terms of their other segments, just for the company and the rest of the business, the rest of the businesses at 21st Century Fox, you know, they have the presidential election, which should really help their television and cable network programming for the remainder of their fiscal 2016, yeah. or at least half of fiscal 2017, especially... Um, so then the news with you know this potential nomination coming up for the Supreme Court justice, just I think a lot of people are going to be glued, obviously, to some of Fox's networks. It's a good time to be Rupert Murdoch. Yes. <laughs> and um, an- another thing is that we're noticed from a lot of other uh, content providers, think Disney as well, for example, is you know they're seeing higher programming costs for their uh, networks, and a lot of that's being driven by sports. So Fox specifically mentioned soccer, Major League Baseball, college football rights is having increase in costs contributing to that, or uh, contributing to, to higher programming costs for that segment. And that's something we're seeing across the board. You know, live sports have have this very uh, obvious understanding that they are the hold for a lot of these, you know, cord cutters right. and things like that, and so they can charge these premium prices. And then otherwise, uh, you know, the stock overall is actually down about 30% since the end of 2014. Uh, I think management's really focused on returning capital to shareholders, too. So they had authorized $5 billion of share repurchases last summer. They expect to complete, you know, to use up that authorization by August 2016. And in the past uh, five years, they've reduced their shares outstanding about Twenty five percent, so pretty oh, wow. significant. Yeah, you know, twenty fifteen they built they bought back about six billion dollars worth of shares. The year before that, almost four billion. So very focused. Uh, the company's definitely very focused on that. I'm interested to see. Um, you know, it might only be the second segment in terms of film entertainment, but just always nice to have fun. You know, fan favorite kind of movies coming out like this for sure. Okay, before we move on, I'm going. I wanted to point our listeners to the newly redesigned Focus.Fool.com. There, you can take advantage of a discount on the Motley Fool Stock Advisor newsletter that works out to $129 for a full two-year subscription. Once again, that is Focus.Fool.com. Uh, so, Vince, we're moving on here to uh, kind of a follow-up story to a show we did, I don't know, three four months ago, something. Yeah, some time ago. Um, but basically, it's a follow-up to uh, 3G Capital, the private equity buyout type firm, and uh, the, all the restaurant brands they've snapped up, which in this case is Burger King and all and, 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 and the profits and the success they've had sure. so, so far. Um, so, they just reported earnings for their Tim Hortons, Burger King brands. How, how are things looking? Sure. So, Restaurant Brands International for full year 2015... Uh, 
it was just I think it was really impressive to see Tim Hortons enjoyed comparable store sales growth of about five point six percent. Burger King logged five point four percent growth. This is in constant. These are currency. almost Chipotle ish numbers from back in the day. So, like. <laughs> so pretty impressive. Um, uh, for both of those uh, brands, and also, you know, they opened 155 and 631 net new locations. That's respectively for Tim Hortons and Burger King. Did you, um, if you didn't catch this, that's fine. Is that mostly Tim Hortons or is that mostly Burger King? No, opens? that was 630. 630 is for Burger King. They okay. have a much bigger network. Oh wow! Okay. And yeah. uh, so their total st- uh, store base increased about 4.2 percent during the year. And both, you know, both businesses saw a lot of successful promotions and new products coming out. And um, they also uh, were pretty. Aggressive in terms of their overseas development in these new mar- in some of the in markets like in the Middle East and Europe, and the stock you know very, investors are really excited. Um, it's trending up, I think, about five percent when I checked in early morning trading. And uh, the the main theme I wanted to bring up is the you know how those results compare to some of the other big fast food burger chains. So McDonald's also reported earnings uh, recently. They saw their comps go up about 1.5% in 2015. And, but the thing is, momentum really picked up for them during the fourth quarter when comps were up 5.7% in the US because of the launch of All Day Breakfast. Oh. So you're, they're seeing some really nice uh, momentum there from, from that promotion. And it seems like that was a big success that's helped turn McDonald's around. Right. When, Honestly, you know, it wasn't that long ago when people were thinking about writing the obituary for that company. You know so, uh, on that note, with uh, just you know, through all of certain products in order to drive customers, talk to me about hot dogs and Burger King. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, interestingly, the uh, Burger King announced that they would actually start serving hot dogs as part of their regular menu. So, you know, a consistent menu offering, not like some special. Right. Uh, some special promotion, and so they've been testing this for about 18 months in markets like Salt Lake City, Memphis, Baltimore, Detroit, and Kansas City. So the hot dogs are launching on February 23rd, and because Burger King has, I think, over 7,000 locations in the U.S., they're going to become the largest chain to offer hot dogs as part of their regular menu. Right. And there's We're a tie-up customers- here with who you mentioned earlier, actually, yeah. with 3G Capital, um, because you know. 3G Capital, obviously, they brought together Burger King and Tim Hortons at the end of, I think it was 2014. It was a big, like, right. $11, $12 billion deal. So, obviously, you know, we talked about 3G Capital again also a few months, or maybe half a year ago in the big Kraft Heinz mashup. Right. And, and of course, Burger King has Heinz ketchup everywhere. So, anyway. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's as if that's not already part of it. Um, they Kraft Heinz also owns Oscar Mayer, which is working with Burger King. To oh offer up these hot dogs, gosh. so it's just kind of a funny thing where three G Capital obviously leveraging the, the, the companies in their portfolio. This, this little arrangement is, <laughs> and um, and you know, and you know the the strong results that we're seeing from Burger King from McDonald's also goes to Wendy's. Uh, who I typically think it was like the number three player in terms of traditional fast food, or for burgers at least. Uh, their same restaurant sales were up three point three percent for twenty fifteen. Um, and all of them enjoyed seemed to enjoy like accelerating comps during the fourth quarter. Some of them uh, attributed that to some like their promotions, but also the really warm weather during the winter maybe helped keep store uh, to go store out. traffic yeah. up. Yeah. And uh, overall, I just wanted to bring this up really just because a lot of people tout the fact that you know these higher quality, better ingredients, fast casual chains are going to be the way of the future. Going to start replacing a lot of the traditional fast food players. But the fact of the matter is, like these companies and their management teams seem to be adapting very well and uh, offering very value minded. Uh, promotions like the two for five dollar deal or the four for four dollar deal that these companies are competing with, and it's resonating with people. So whether it's breakfast or hot dogs, we'll see how well that works. Um, you know, these companies. You want to go f- get one? I kind of want to go get. Are one far, now, far from being you know on their deathbed, so to speak. Cool. Well, thank you for your thoughts, Vince. Thanks, John. If you're a loyal listener and have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool dot com. Again, that's industryfocus at fool dot com. And as always, people in this program may have interests in the stocks that they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear on this program. For Vincent Chen, I'm Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on! Fool on!